Well, good evening. Greetings. The Lord is with you. It's a Friday evening, and this is the time. It's normally 7, but this is when I was able to be free from family on my day off uh, and uh, come and, and meet with you for our evening study. We're in the book of Hebrews, and tonight is Hebrews chapter 6. Um, I'm pleased to be with you. Uh, it's a, this is the first day uh, that I've had a day off, and I think in a month. And I had two days off in a row back then uh, because I was quarantined with COVID. And so uh, I'm thankful that I have had a real day off today. And uh, uh, now I am uh, enjoying uh, 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 looking through and, and, and meeting with you for the devotions. Hi to everybody who's watching, um, Linda and Gail, or Peggy, I guess, Shirley. Uh, good evening to you, Friday evening. And... Uh, um, I'm going to get back to doing some family things tonight, but for now, a little break. Hey, Shirley, uh, welcome to you as well. Well, let's start as we do each night with the sign of the cross. We are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's a really important thing as we consider the warning we have. And boy, these are harsh warnings. And we've already had a couple, and this is the third warning. It's only four verses long or five. Um and, uh, well, well, we'll get into it um, uh, and try and understand that warning. Then, um, uh, uh, well, good enough for that, but the sign of the cross is, is something we can hold on to in the midst of these warnings. So we want to start with a word of prayer and then get going. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together this evening. Thank you for your word. And Lord, for the the way in which we are challenged some days in your word. Thank you, Lord, that this word, although it begins in chapter 6 with a, with a warning, it ends with an amazing promise. And Lord, let us hold on to the whole of your word um, and to your great promise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter 6. Um, the beginning of chapter 6 is related to the, the end of uh, chapter 5 when uh, the writer of Hebrews was warning against apostasy um, and about the problem of becoming dull in hearing. Uh, just think what a, an amazing uh, teaching that is. Good evening, Tom and family. Um, the, uh, um, that that response last night of the uh, uh, chapter 5, the end of chapter 5, about being dull in hearing. And and so because the people have not been growing, uh, their ears are closed, they think they know it all, and they know hardly anything, uh, he's not been able to move beyond the elemental principles, the basic principles of the Christian faith, which the writer of Hebrews calls milk instead of solid food. Um and uh, uh, so now we're going to hear more about what is milk and solid food as we begin chapter 6, verse 1. Here we go. Therefore, let us leave the elementary principle, elementary doctrine of Christ, and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of. So here he's going to list some of the things that are just the basic teachings of the Christian faith that every newborn Christian needs to be brought up in in the, the earliest days of their Christian life. And uh, probably something worth us covering, and I think in some ways in our new member class, we, we try to go through these things. But, but it's very intentionally listed what are the basic principles of the, of the Christian faith. So not laying again. Let's move on to maturity. Let's not just stay children. Let's grow up in our faith. But let me tell you what the basic foundational um, childhood uh, uh, understandings are. Hey, Keith, uh, glad to see you're on. Our family, uh, Debbie, welcome as well. So chapter 6, verse 1, um, not laying again a foundation of, here's the basic teachings, Repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. Repentance of everything we think we can do to earn God's favor and love and salvation. A basic teaching moving on to repentance of that and to faith in, in God. 
in what he has done on the cross. Uh, so I, I guess those are related, but, but repentance and faith and instruction about washings. Now, there's one great washing in the Christian faith. There is the uh, cleansing of sin in, in, uh, in holy baptism. Uh, it may go on here as they're talking about washings. Maybe they're talking about the difference between uh, um, the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. And that's why it's, it's in the plural. Uh, remember, as, as Paul was going around uh, with um, he, and Priscilla and Aquila, uh, Priscilla and Aquila met Apollos. And some people think Apollos is the author here of Hebrews, but well, we have no, no idea. But Apollos had only been instructed in the baptism of John. And they, Aquila and Priscilla, helped him to come to a fuller understanding of the Christian faith and of Jesus and the baptism that Jesus gives, which is full of the Spirit and of fire. So that's probably why the word, um, plural word, washings, is used. Um, so repentance and faith and washings and the laying on of hands. Now, that's somewhat related. Uh, this fourth issue, the laying on of hands, uh, certainly happens in baptism. It also happens when people are being prayed for, um, for healing. It happens, uh, we, we heard about it many times in Acts, when people were being commissioned to be sent off, whether it was the deacons in, in, in Acts 6 or it was Paul going on his missionary journeys. The, the, the brothers, the elders of a place would lay hands on her. Paul would lay hands on people and commission them to be the elders of a church. So there's an actual passing on. We, we do this in, in church. We lay hands on at baptisms. We have a laying on of hands at weddings, at confirmations, um, at services of prayer for healing, um, we, uh, um, uh, at a funeral, I, I lay my hands on the casket or the urn for a final prayer uh, for a person. Um, we have all these times of laying on of hands. And so I, I think that, that uh, that's clearly what's being spoken about, repentance, faith, instruction about washings and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the final eternal judgment. Um, so the basic teaching of the resurrection of the dead and that we will all uh, be raised to, to, uh, to the judgment, to the final judgment of God, which we don't have to fear as Christians uh, because our judgment is secured by Christ. Uh, but these are the six elemental teachings of the church that ought to be something that even a, a newborn Christian comes to understand, one who receives milk. But there's, there's more. So let me... Just finish that up. Um, and this we will do. We will move on to maturity, to more things. This we will do if God permits. And now the warning, verses four through eight. And it's, it's quite a scary warning. For it is impossible. Um, quite a word to find in Scripture. When Jesus himself nothing says nothing is impossible for God. The Gabriel, angel Gabriel said that to Mary. Jesus said it to someone uh, about who needed healing. Nothing is impossible. Um, and yet here we have the writer of Hebrews saying, and, and so we got to struggle with this a little bit, but let's read the whole thing and then talk about it. It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God um, and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and, to, and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being crushed, and its end is to be burned. 
Well, Jesus often talks about uh, um, the grain being saved and the chaff being burned or driven by the wind. So, this is the question in this warning. Um, and, and if you remember that uh, um, Bible Project uh, uh, video, it said at the end that there are these uh, difficult uh, uh, warnings, and there's five of them, and this is number three, but they aren't make, made, they're, they're, they're meant for us to uh, feel uncomfortable, but not to cause us fear. Well, this one kind of causes fear, or could easily. Is it possible for you to lose your salvation? Had a call from a nursing home, person in a nursing home, um, a week or two ago, and he's called uh, several times since. One of our members works at that nursing home, and he was asking religious questions uh, of our nurse. And our nurse said, well, why don't you call my pastor? He'll talk to you. <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, but my, my, I was going to call him up on my cell phone, and after a, a second, I thought, oh, I don't want to do that. I call, I, And I usually use my cell phone for all conversations, but I called him back on the church phone, and he calls me periodically on the church phone, and that's that's fine. I'm glad I didn't give him my cell phone number, um, uh, because most of his problems are are fearful. They aren't real, um, and he and he's worried about committing the unforgivable sin. Well, a passage like this would set him off. I won't ever share this passage with him. Um, it is impossible. Now, if if the Bible is true, <laughs> and I think it is, uh, nothing's impossible with God. But for us as humans. So that's a, a clear difference here. Nothing's impossible for God, but for humans, you can go down a road so far with hardening your heart and hardening your ear that you get to a place where your heart is just stone. But remember in the Old Testament, God is able to take out the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. God is able to do a heart surgery. That's the whole essence of our, our uh, Lenten journey this year on Wednesdays. So maybe this was introduced by that theme of being dull in hearing. Don't. Th this is the warning. Don't let that happen to you. Remain open like good soil, not the hard path. And then once you are soiled, don't be rocky soil or thorny soil, um, but be good soil. And, and don't be dull of hearing as you come into the presence of worship, of God in worship, or as you come into Bible study time or reading devotionally, have an open heart for God to speak, not a closed mind. Well, here we go. For it is impossible for humans who allow their hearts to get hardened. In the case of those who, like, it sounds like a list of real Christians. And and I was going through my study Bible, and they give four different possible responses to this. Uh, yes, these are real Christians who can fall away. Uh, most people say, no, a real Christian can't fall away. But I find that kind of tr language troubling, a real Christian, like somehow I'm judging you whether or not you're a real Christian, or that's the problem of the guy who's calling me. Oh, I don't know if I'm a real Christian. Um, and, and so uh, I have trouble with that, that way of speaking and thinking about real Christians. Kind of puts all the responsibility on me when in fact becoming a Christian has to do with uh, repentance from dead works and faith toward God who does the work. Um, that's an elementary teaching and is so missed by so many, even Christians. So let's just read it the way it sounds. It's impossible, again, for humans. Nothing's impossible for God. It's impossible in the case of those who have been enlightened, that the switch has been turned on, they've become Christians and have tasted the heavenly gift. Is, is that communion? Or the heavenly gift of salvation. They, they've swallowed it in, hook, line, and sinker. Um, and have shared in the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is a sign that they've been baptized, right? When you were baptized, uh, Cornelius and his family in Acts were filled with the Spirit, just like the disciples had been. And Paul and Peter thought, well, I guess there's no reason why we can't baptize them. Baptism and the Holy Spirit go together. So they've, they, they've come to understanding about Christ. 
and they've accepted Christ, uh, tasted of the heavenly gift of salvation, shared in the Holy Spirit, um, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God. They've, they've begun to grow through reading the scriptures, and um, they have tasted the word of God and the powers of the age to come. The power of God demonstrated in the life of Jesus, demonstrated uh, with signs and wonders through the apostles and through the church, and they have experienced God answering their prayers. Here's a, here's a person who's become a believer. I think this is simply what the text is saying. Uh, with what all the other people are saying, I, I, I don't know. But, but the text, if I just stay with the text, then, then I, I don't think I'm far wrong. It's impossible for us if we've allowed ourselves to become hardened, so hard, it's impossible to restore ourselves. Um, God can do anything. I'm convinced of that. But here he's thinking about, I've been enlightened. I've come to an understanding about Christ. I, I've become a Christian. I've tasted of the heavenly gift of salvation, shared in the Holy Spirit, experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit, tasted of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, answered prayers. And and then have fallen away. I guess I don't know what it means exactly to fall away unless it's pretty clear. It's, it, is it just a little slip? I don't think so. I don't think he means a, a sheep that's got lost his way. We all struggle all the time. And I think if this is one of these passages like the unforgivable sin that if you think you've if you're worried about having committed it, you obviously haven't committed it or you wouldn't be worried about it. Your heart would be so hardened. But here it's possible for a person who's become a real Christian um, uh, and then have fallen away. And, and that's the question some people ask. Is it possible for a real Christian to so fall away from God that, that God's grace can't reach them? I, I don't think it's possible uh, when we are saved. Uh, Jesus says it in John 10. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. But remember Judas was, was part of the disciples who had experienced everything except he didn't get the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He didn't live that long. Um, and he turned away. Um, so he didn't get all the things personally, although he saw Jesus doing these things, um, that the other disciples got. So is it possible that this is a person who is on the fringe of the Christian community, gone through the rituals, but it seems more than that. It, it seems like they say they've tasted it, they've experienced it, um, and that's not just been ritual. Um, but if they have fallen away, is it possible? Um, I, I've, I've uh, in my years at Boardman, uh, we used to have some ecumenical service, interfaith services uh, with the, the Jewish congregation in Boardman. And some of the lay people there were very sensitive to any naming of Jesus. The most sensitive ones were people who had been raised Christian and become Jewish. They seem to be very offended any time, in my experience, that we would talk about Jesus. And it became such a difficulty that we finally stopped having interfaith services until 9-11 happened and we had one or two. Um, so so um, I, I think this is talking about a person who has knowing Christ completely and then has walked away and joined the Hindu religion and absolutely given up Christ. So you'd have to ask yourself, who could give up Christ? And, and, and the, the religious faith, they must never have understood what the Christian faith was. How could they give him up? I think that's why some of the commentators try and think, well, they can't have been a true Christian because how could they ever give up Christ, the gift above all gifts? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how a person can give up Christ. So maybe they never were really Christian or, or 
but he's saying here, at least hypothetically, and I'll show you why I say that in just a moment, that it's impossible for a person who's become a real Christian that if they have fallen away, or I would say walked away and turned their back on Christ and come to worship some other God. Um, we have all sorts of people becoming Christian who worshiped other gods, but what if you gave up Jesus after being a Christian and, wa and worshiped another God? It is impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. You can't bring such a person back to faith. Well, again, nothing's impossible for God, but for humans, this would be a very difficult thing if in fact they were a real Christian and they had walked away from the faith. Perhaps they weren't really a Christian and they were just going through some ritual motion, but the, the words don't sound like that. This is a strong warning. We're going to hear something that this is maybe just um, a hypothetical. He tells a parable that such, sounds much like the parables of Jesus. Land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a useful crop receives a blessing. But if the rain falls on land and it bears thorns and thistles, watch out. Um, it, its end is fire. So God will bless us. Here's the warning. Take this seriously. One of the previous warnings was the wilderness wandering. They never entered God's rest. Be careful to trust God. Here, if you've begun the Christian faith, don't give up on Jesus. That's the warning. Now, hypothetical. That seems to be verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Okay. Hypothetically, it would be impossible to restore a person to salvation if they have walked away from everything they experienced in Jesus Christ. But, the writer of Hebrews says, this isn't true of you. Okay, that's why I think the warning is hypothetical and just not meant to make us afraid, but to take seriously the faith we have and our walk with God and tend the faith and make sure that it's being nurtured and strengthened. That, I think, is true in this passage um, and why he's probably speaking as a hypothetical. I'm going to write a little note in my Bible here. So, in your case, I'm sure this isn't true. We feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. And now the encouragement. For God is not unjust as to overlook. Here's what I see in your life. Fruit, uh, the crop being produced. Um, here's, God is not unjust as to overlook. Uh, and God sees, and the writer of Hebrews sees to the, uh, amongst the people he's writing to, uh, God won't overlook your work and your love that you have shown in his name in serving the saints as you still do. And, and God has been watching you and I've been watching and you do good works and you share good love with the saints. And I desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the same, uh, we, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of faith until the end. Just as you share God's love, keep going with the faith. Now, he's writing in a time of persecution. And so there's a temptation for some people to fall away, to avoid the persecution. And, and he's encouraging them. You've been sharing the love of Christ. You've been sharing good works. Be just as earnest about tending your faith. God will see you through. So that none of you, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who gets the promises? Those who don't give up. And now there comes the example. And a wonderful promise 
in the life of Abraham. Um, if you want to see somebody who has stuck to the promises of God, even in difficulty, who better to look at than Father Abraham, who journeyed in the promised land that God had promised, but he only owned his, his own grave plot, and who uh, was promised children and had to wait 25 years for the promise to come true. Well, let's look at what he says about Abraham. Verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, here's a quote from Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, surely I will bless you and multiply you. Well, we could turn back, and I did, of course, and looked up that quote. That's the story of the sacrifice or the near sacrifice of Isaac. And after he had taken up the knife to slay his son, after binding him and placing him on the altar, uh, the angel stopped him and provided the ram in the bush. And God said, now surely I will bless you and multiply you. He confirmed once again the promise that God had made many times in Genesis 12, Genesis 17, and here in, in Genesis 22. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Now, his son was a number of years old, and God had already, 25 years later, made the promise come true. And then a dozen years later, uh, God confirms the promise because he didn't allow Abraham to sacrifice his son. Uh, of God, of course, God wouldn't, because the only son who's going to die uh, as a sacrifice will be God's own son, right? Uh, Isaac. Uh, becomes Jesus, and God gives up his own son. He was testing Abraham whether he would do what God himself would do, and Abraham was willing. Wow. But God did not ask him. God reserved that right for himself. Having waited, uh, patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. It's kind of like we take an oath when we begin some testimony, uh, whether it's a deposition or before Congress or in court, we raise our hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, an oath um, uh, was a sign that you had, had made a promise. Um, uh, for, um, so God likewise, verse 17, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Um, the heirs of the promise, uh, the, the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis, and, and there was a threefold promise that, that he would have many descendants as stars of the heaven, that he would, he would have the land that God would give to him, and that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. Those three things, right? The land, the descendants, and the blessing to all the nations of the world. Those who are the heir of that promise, well, that would include us. Um, uh, God guaranteed that with an oath, and that oath is found in Genesis 22, verse 16. And uh, I will turn to that. Again, this is after the sacrifice of Isaac. Um, verse 16 by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you. Um, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. And your, your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offering shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And Abraham returned to the young man and they arose and went together to Beersheba. Um, so um, God made an oath. I swear, it says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. So he made an oath so that by two unchangeable things, God's word and his oath about his word, two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Again, in these difficult days of, of, um, uh, of 
trial and persecution, hold on to God and his promises. So that warning was really scary, but we're driven by the writer of Hebrews to the promises of God. This is what we can hold on to. And nothing is impossible for God. And the promise of God is for those who believe and repent, they shall be saved. Hold on to the promises of God. We have verse 19, I'm almost done here. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, kind of like our anchor cross. A hope that endure, that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, the, the mercy seat of forgiveness. Where Jesus, behind the curtain, has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Remember at his death, the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, that was torn in two. And Jesus has entered into the holiest place by the sacrifice of his blood. We'll hear more about that in the chapters to come. Jesus has gone beyond this earthly veil into the heaven, into heaven, into the very presence of God and God's mercy. On our behalf, as a forerunner, he has gone first, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We heard about that yesterday, and chapter 7 is given over to the study of Melchizedek, so we'll wait for that till Monday when we hit chapter 7. Um, so that is, again, the promise. The promise in the midst of all our fears is that this is hypothetical. You have, but I, I, I like those elemental things, and now there's going to be a movement toward maturity. Let's be sure of our faith that, that when we are baptized, we are forgiven, and we are called to faith in God, and we have had hands laid on us at baptism, confirmation, weddings, services of healings, ordinations, uh, the laying on of hands for commissioning, for prayer, um, and, and we've been washed, and we've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's Let's not lose sight of the, the beginning teachings, but let's move on to deeper teachings. And, and as we move on, don't allow your hearts to get hardened. Hold fast to God who's holding fast to you and will never let you go. And it's God who makes promises that we can hold on to, promises which hold on to us and will never let us go. And they serve as an anchor for the soul and hold on to nothing less than, not the promise, but Jesus, who has entered into heaven as the great high priest, who is now familiar with all your weaknesses, and he is praying for you. Well, these are promises that take me away from the fears that are in the beginning of the chapter, uh, why these warnings ought not to cause us to be afraid, but let them drive us to Jesus, who is holding on to us, who is in heaven, who is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And let's hear on Monday what we have to learn about that. Well, thank you for letting me spend with you time throughout, I think, was a challenging chapter in the book of Hebrews. But if we can just read the whole book, and he's great at doing this, this apologetics where he goes from point one to two and three. Let's not get stuck at point two. Let's get on to point three and four so we can see the whole story. Uh, but it's a story that is centered soundly on the promises of God and the presence of Christ who has died, risen, and ascended to the right hand of God where he intercedes for you and where nothing can separate you from his love. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight. Let's have a prayer. Father, there are fearful times in Scripture that cause us to be afraid. But when we look at you and your promises, we are reminded once again of repentance from dead works to faith in a living God who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Lord, strengthen us in our faith. Cause us, Lord, not to be hardened in our ears, but to, to approach you in worship on Sundays, in daily devotions with an open heart and an open mind uh, where, Lord, we can receive your word. And thank you that the word today is one full of promises. Pray, Lord, your blessing on the faith of each of us 
as we move forward, encouraged by this day's lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. God loves you. He has sent his son for you, and his son is in heaven praying for you. God loves you, and so do I. Have a good evening. See you at church on uh, Saturday worship, Sunday morning worship, and then see you for devotions Monday evening. Bye-bye.